Hello everyone. My name is Siri. I'm from 111 Canada and I'm here to be your host today for the fourth round of Pitch. Yes, my name is Siri, like the iPhone. I have heard all of the jokes, so please don't make them after this. Um, as you know, Pitch is a live on-stage pitch battle, startup battle. We have chosen some of the uh, best startups from amongst different industries, and they're going to be doing three minutes each, followed by a three-minute Q&A with our esteemed judges, who I'm going to introduce right now. First up, we have Felipe Milan from SendGrid. We have Hanan Brand from Cornerstone Venture Partners. We have Jesse Gaston from Denton's Venture Technology, and we have Christina Alfonso Erjan from Madeira Global. Our judges will be scoring our startups in five categories, product, potential to disrupt, financials, team, and quality of pitch. Our first startup today is Take Task, so please welcome to the stage our first pitcher. Pardon? Oh. Just have a little technical glitch, so I will. Um, why don't you guys actually talk a little bit about what you do quickly and what you're looking for in a in a pitch? You want to start? So I guess what we're looking for, what I'm looking for, is some uh, clarity about exactly what the what the what technology does, uh, what this product makes different from what the competitors are currently doing. Good. Anybody else before we get going? Any last minute tips? Just a clearly defined revenue model and uh, an awareness of where they operate within the marketplace. Gotcha. All right, you got that, Sebastian? Okay, all right, so we're all set to go. So our first uh, pitcher is from Take Task. Please welcome Sebastian. Hi, so I'm Sebastian Stajinsky and I'm the founder and the CEO of Take Task. Imagine you are an operation manager in a retail chain like Tesco or Zara. And you have hundreds of stores all over the country. And um, each day, all of your stores have something like 40 different recurring tasks. And they get another 20 ad hoc via SMSs, emails, or telephones. And in many other areas like merchandising, uh, product replenishment, cleaning, food safety, etc. Of course, you want your um, employees to follow the standards, but honestly, they uh, sometimes can misunderstand, forget, or even refuse to comply with those standards, and you will not even be aware of this. So uh, we enable smart uh, quality assurance and uh, standard, uh, standards um, uh, execution. With our task management application, uh, we have um, we deliver a task management application with a, a communication tool and micro training for uh, distribution and control of your standards all over the company. Um, we are on a, a productivity and online corporation tool market, which is about $5 billion uh, and is growing in a two digit space. We now concentrate on retail and Horeca as they really have this kind of um, solutions. So most cases, you uh, know task management as dedicated to office work. But we are a mass distribution and uh, feedback platform for companies with dispersed labor force that have rare access to computers. Um, uh, so why clients choose us? So first of all, we have an easy to use online editor to create even complex uh, conditional tasks user-friendly application where the employee can simply, for example, make a photo of a sandwich section and send it to you con to control. We have white label uh, cloud solution, and we also have Microsoft technologies that uh, help us in implementing in uh, uh, companies. And we also embedded some uh, additional technologies like real-time recognition to make audits uh, of prices and products uh, much faster and automated, like at the petrol station. So we are a SaaS company. And we charge per user, and the average ticket is about 2,000 uh, euro per month per company. Um, we have our own growth hacking and sales team, but we also have cooperation with companies like PwC, Orange, T-Mobile, and many more. Um, it's a sales cooperation. We, got, uh, we started our product sales new, new platform in August. We got already three paying customers, like Auchan, Top Market. Uh, we got another 15 in trials in Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, in uh, South Africa as well, in Singapore, and another 40 in the pipeline. 
Um, our goal for 2018 is 200K and for 2019 it's 2 million. Um, we have an uh, experienced uh, uh, team in entrepreneurship and uh, C-level executives, so we are ready to deliver these ambitious plans. We have raised um, 350K from founders, angel investors, and some EU grants before 2018. And this year we have raised 300K from VC and some angel investors uh, to build a better task automated distribution uh, uh, system. And we also uh, now have a ticket for 100K to end our goal, investment goal for 2018. We also raised 100K from, um, from uh, some uh, EU grants. Um, and next year, after uh, checking our sales uh, growth hacking tactics, we want to raise additional 1 million to scale up faster. And we also want to acquire 1.5 million from EU grants to build a second R&D uh, project based on AI. Thank you very much for your attention. OK, thanks, Sebastian. We have a couple minutes uh, now for questions from the judges. So um, many of the companies today have uh, solutions. Are you trying to build uh, your own solution to compete with them, or are you built into an ecosystem of task management solutions? No, we have our own solution, but we integrate many other solutions like this, real-time recognition, uh, or image scanning, or, uh, or, or image recognition. These are different two technologies. We also now uh, cooperate with companies that have intelligence shelves to build automatic uh, tasks for the employees, if the shelf is empty, for example. I know it's a small pool today, but do you have an idea, sense of what your customer acquisition cost is and how you plan to go 10x by next year in terms of your revenue? Yeah, sure. Um, it takes about one month uh, uh, to, I don't, it, it actually it's quite easy to encourage the, the, the clients in the retail sector to have the, 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 tri the trial. Uh, something like 80, 70 percent of the companies we uh, we go with a pitch or with a with a DAC, they say, okay, ah, oh, that's interesting. This really solves our problem. Let's check it out. And this is a cost for them as well. And uh, as I said, we have only a few clients now, so I cannot say what is the uh, next uh, phase and what will be, uh, you know, the, the how narrow will be the sales funnel. But it looks really optimistic. Uh, we we hear very good uh, information from clients. They simply we now have like five clients that said. We like it, we have to go for the budget because we have to buy smartphones for our employees. We don't have it. That's why we team up with T-Mobile, Orange, and we now talk with other telecoms because we give a opportunity for these companies to sell more. Now, the same as PVWC. They digitalize the, the and, 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 P, uh, and BCG also, we work with them. They digitalize the, the workspace and they give them a solution. We're actually gonna leave it there because we went a little bit over. So thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next up on the pitch battle stage is Oliver from Almond. Hello. So 18 years ago, my son was born, and one night it hit me that with climate change, his future was looking really, really bleak. And actually, as someone in the soft drinks industry with, with, my, with my own drinks brands, maybe I was actually a part of the problem. And from my subsequent research, I identified three things that really stood out. First of all, we only make up 0.01% of life on this earth, yet we have made far more destruction than all other species combined, and it's accelerating. Secondly, the IPCC released their report a couple of weeks ago, and in short, we need to get to global net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And to hit that trajectory, we basically need to halve our emissions in only 12 years. And the third thing was that the focus is on travel and power, but actually 70% of our CO2 output comes from the stuff that we buy. And it's actually our wallets that are the biggest weapon of mass destruction. But what if we could reverse engineer our wallets to actually become a part of the solution? So imagine if we could highlight the benefits of buying responsible brands and we could make it easier for consumers to find those brands. Imagine if we could monitor the CO2 impacts of our consumption patterns and we could validate the claims that brands make. Imagine if we could then even reward consumers for buying these impact brands, and as the ecosystem grows, consumers could even have those rewards potentially appreciate in value. Well, thanks to the recent um, convergence of DLT blockchain, IoT, and smartphone use, 
we could do all of this. And we actually have a live prototype on Armand with one of my drinks brands, which is fact, which I'm going to give you in a second. So how does it work? The, um, within the Armand Foundation, the tech and the standards are all protected. And the brands basically pay between half and 1% of their wholesale product value to be a part of the Armand community. They then get given Armand matrix codes, they hide in their products, and consumers can download our app and can scan the codes. For consumers, there are many benefits, but for the first time, they can actually see which brands are truly socially and environmentally responsible. And they can get financially rewarded, they can see the supply chain transparency of where all the ingredients have come from, and we can gamify the experience and they can increase their positive impact score. For brands, because they're able to digitize their products, they can actually financially reward their consumers and they can growth hack their sales. They can also understand their customers for the first time with anonymized insights on time, date, and location of the scan data. And they can build much more meaningful one-to-one -one relationships with their customers built on transparency and trust. So where are we at? So we have self-funded self -funded our live um, POC with Fact Organic Water. Um, we launched the 1st of November um, of our, our round of funding and we're raising $4 million to fund our pilots in London and San Francisco. Uh, we're building out a great team with experience in consumer brands, banking, blockchain and crypto. And I just want to finish on this final note that, you know, if, imagine like, if like me you felt maybe helpless that you can make a difference, I hope that I've shown you that with Armand, you know, we can actually make a difference on an individual level and we can actually make a huge difference on a global level. And imagine if we had you know, people from all around the world, potentially thousands and hopefully millions of people, all on the Armand app, all monitoring our, our impact on the Armand app in the palm of our hands. Thank you. OK. All right. Do we have some questions from all, for Oliver? Hi. How do you get your money? So we charge brands between half and 1% of the wholesale value of the products to be on the platform. And do you pre-select um, the brands depending on, based on the criteria that fit? Yeah, so brands have to basically meet the minimum environmental and social sort of standards. Um, and to start with, we're focusing on B Corp brands because they've got um, a really robust kind of uh, assessment system already in place. I run an ESG reporting firm, so this is my sweet spot. So my question to you is, how do you maintain integrity if you're also rating these brands to also be uh, having them be part of your revenue channel? So we, we, you know, the foundation kind of operates independently. There's actually two arms to the project. There's the nonprofit foundation, and then there's a for-profit arm which raises investment to help scale up the um, ecosystem. So there's a separate committee that comes up with the standards and we will have separate partners that then check to make sure brands are adhering to the minimum requirements to be on the platform. So you were talking about 4 million euros that you're uh, uh, raising? Four, 4 million US dollars. Okay, so what's your plans? What do you believe you can achieve with that? So we're building up these, this, these hubs in London and San Francisco. Um, and by March, we'll have 10 brands cost sector in, in London and 10 in San Francisco, um, ranging from startups to uh, probably the largest brand we're talking to has $50 million um, in annual sales. So that, 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 that investment will go towards basically setting up our, um, our pilots in London and San Francisco and you know, promoting the platform. And well, our plan is in a year's time to have 150 brands on the platform. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Oliver. Next up, we have two pitchers together. Please welcome Naz and Sandra from Aligner. Hi, everyone. I'm Sandra. This is my brother, Naz. Hello. All right, a bit slow. So, in my previous jobs, I had to handle and manage 35 documents in six languages. 
And as you can understand that the constantly updating them and making up to date together with your product and service is extremely difficult. It takes months to get the job done. Every international company has a variety of types of content that they have to keep updated in different languages. So pro policies, product descriptions, contracts, marketing materials, legal, and so on. The content is growing, and the biggest issue is that in three years, we'll have 5x more content, and uh, managing the translation is still manual. While searching for the solution to this problem, we got inspired by these two gentlemen, James Watson and Francis Crick. They were the first ones to demonstrate the DNA structure. What we discovered is that by creating a DNA to every document, plus live DNA versioning of this, will enable us to do the changes of 100 languages as it will be one. How exciting is this? A liner detects even one character change in a specific paragraph in one language and applies changes into the same paragraph in all other languages. Companies spend globally around $50 billion on translations. And getting translations done is a question of about 50 clicks. We know how to make it with one click. So how a liner works? It's easy. Just think of Dropbox. You add your content, you edit, and you share. Plus, you will have available translation and proofs reading services at one click. In cooperation with Y Combinator, company upgraded, we made a case study and proved that updating your content is seven times faster with a liner compared to any alternative. Our pricing model is flexible. We have something for individuals, startups, and enterprises. We earn revenue from based uh, monthly fees and commissions on translations. We target both the companies that have multilingual content and the translation agencies, which makes the customer acquisition cost pretty low. Just by looking at this slide, you will understand what does it bring to a successful company to scale. We made this photo on the day we launched Aligner DNA. Today, we're a team of six, and on the behalf of the whole team, I'd like to invite you to visit aligner.io. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, three minutes for questions. So um, last year, uh, Google Translate added AI capabilities that make their translation much better. How do you compete with their translation? This is awesome that they did that. So our main advantage is automating the workflow. So the translation is not that we provide. So you have this option available in our software. But what you can do is you can manage the updates in unlimited amount of languages and make the work done in your team. So um, happy for Google and happy for us to use this service as well. In the and we, we can leverage that because we're about the content management. How about quality control? How do you how do you know the translation is right? You have three options. You can use machine learning. You can use our API partners on translations, or if you have team or agency that is doing your translations, please go ahead. So you just work in the liner platform, and we take the platform fee for that. So it's a combination of uh, flat fee that you pay for the service and then additional services that you can pay on top of it, like uh, uh, online translation, etc. Absolutely. Plus proofreading and plus more coming. Yes. And the pricing model is based on the volume. So the more users you have there, the more content, the more languages. So we're currently handling over 100 languages. So if you are using all of your documentation in 100 languages, then it's easy, but you will be paying probably the enterprise package price. I just have one last one, which is, what's your ideal exit strategy? Can you, can you, Could you please repeat the question? Didn't hear. What is your ideal exit strategy? Well, actually, we already understand today that if Dropbox, Google are all working in the same field, but they are tackling 
like a very uh, short uh, part of the massive problem. So we're trying to approach the content managing, management in a wide. So basically we understand that they all will need that type of technology. So Dropbox and Google both are good uh, candidates to acquire a liner. Have some more time. So if you have any companies in your portfolios who have multilingual documents and contents, please invite them to Aligner. Would be happy to help them. OK, thank you, Aligner. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our fourth battler is now ready. We have Gareth from Gamatech. Hi, everyone. It was here at Web Summit one year ago that the seed of an idea was planted. It struck me that loads of people have awesome ideas that just stay locked in their heads because it's too hard to bring them to life. But what if their idea could truly propel humankind forward? What if Al Gore's appeal here in 2017 to fight against climate change using technology were to suffer because the right idea never took flight? I'm Gareth Edge, and I left last year's Web Summit so inspired to ins extend the, the reach of technology that I quit my job, I founded Gamma Tech, and I'm now leading a team dedicated to breaking down the barriers for would-be innovators. We live in a society of creators. Of a thousand people surveyed, 460 people had ideas that could make an impact, but only 20 did anything about it, and just five managed to deliver anything. And the reason people gave for not realizing their ideas is that it's, it's too hard, too risky, and too costly. And even when they managed to get over these barriers, they rarely had a platform for success. And that's where Gamma Tech comes in. We've created a framework that provides secure, automatically scaling, cloud-based solutions. All of the things that people tend not to think about when they're focused purely on their ideas at this point they just want the freedom and the tools to be able to experiment and to give life to their creations. So we're packaging up our framework into services that place intuitive tools in the hands of anyone that may need technology to uh, launch their ideas. Our first product, Thoughtformer, is based on the concept of connecting jigsaw pieces. And here it is in action. It requires no technical skills. And with just a few clicks and connections in the work area on the left, it transforms your ideas into web and native mobile apps, which work immediately in the previewer on the right, or indeed directly on your mobile devices. Our future products will incorporate uh, voice capabilities and AI assistance to help not only create applications, but also entire businesses around people's ideas. Everything needed to help making realize your ideas easier, less risky, and all offered with a simple and affordable pay-as-you-go subscription fee. We're tapping into a sector that's got growing demand. Uh, experts predict this market to be worth $27 billion by 2020, but our initial focus will be on micro-organizations and entrepreneurs in the UK and the US, giving a total accessible market of 58 million customers. We're self-funded so far, but we're now seeking to adopt an investment-led approach, and we're projecting profits of $2 million in year three, but that'll go up to $41 million in year five. Investment will fuel both the development and launch of our products, but also establish our operational uh, functions. It's credit to my awesome team that we've won places on both the Alpha Startup track this year and this very pitching competition, but we know that this is just the beginning. So thank you for letting me talk about Gamma Tech's vision for delivering technology for all and for realizing your ideas. And I welcome any questions. So first of all, I love the vision. I love the pain that you're trying to solve. But I have a question. There's a lot of tools doing um, prototyping tools, like Envision and a few more. How, how are you different than, than them? Yes, so um, what we've discovered in our market research and our competitor analysis is that there's, there are a number of competitors out there. Uh, we're clearly playing in the low-code development platform space, 
But what they, when you scratch the surface and when you try to do anything a little bit sophisticated, you actually need to get your hands dirty and start coding. Um, with our solution, we're completely no code. So it's for completely non-technical people. And we can accommodate very sophisticated solutions using our proprietary technology. My main question is just who owns the IP, right? Because that's something that's important. If it's your idea, you want to make sure you own 100% of the code. How does that work on your Ab platform? Absolutely. It's a very good question. Um, so the IP of the idea creator is fully owned by the person that's created it. So everything that's above our framework, so their ideas, their content, their data, their uh, application visuals, all belongs to the, the, the customer. But the code? Their code, if we were to um, bring it out of our framework, then they can have access to the code and it would all fully belong to them. So what's, what stage is the product? Uh, it's still an alpha version. I guess you have still a few more capabilities that you want to implement. Absolutely. So um, we're really early stage at the moment. We literally, this didn't exist a year ago. Um, we have basically, a, we've got a, quite a small but mighty team that have um, concentrated on building the fundamentals and the framework. That is fully functional. And we have built out full solutions on top of that framework. But we now need to bring it to the masses, which is where we need to bring the Thoughtformer product uh, to market. We have a fully functioning prototype, which we can show anybody at this stage. Um, but we now need the investment to actually bring that to market and to uh, fully realize the potential of solving this problem. So the vision you presented is very wide. But I, I guess this solution is not relevant for all sector, sectors. So is there any specific sector that you want to focus on? as the first uh, go-to-market? Um, not anything specifically, because we feel that we can accommodate a, a really wide range of ideas. Um, but it, to be honest, it, it, no, there is no single sector. Um, it, it really can be used by anybody. So we are going after the smaller kind of organizations in the UK and the US just to uh, capitalize on the English speaking uh, countries for now. Um, and then we'll roll out more globally uh, subsequently. Just la la one comment, uh, we're not looking for profits. If the company is going okay. to succeed, Uber yep. today is not profitable. Okay. Most of the companies are not profitable. We're looking into revenues, profit is not in our business uh, oh, venture. So that's, Thank you for the feedback. And I can give you the revenue details if you want. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we're halfway through the fourth round of pitch battle. Next up is Dave from Nomad X. I may not look like a digital nomad, but I am. After starting and selling my last companies, my wife and I traveled the world, and what we realized is there, there, there wasn't a, an affordable solution for us for staying in places for longer than one month at a time. We were limited to Airbnb and to uh, booking.com options. And we were also having a hard time finding social community, professional communities. And we're not alone. 11% of the workforce is going to be remote by the year 2020. There are 9.6 million digital nomads today, and this is supposed to increase to 100 million by the year 2030. So this is a huge market opportunity. The digital nomads, typically 25 to 45 years old, uh, slow travelers, typically on a budget. Uh, they're creating their own lifestyle and their own jobs to be able to travel the world, typically digital professionals, marketers, programmers. The common problems with nomads is loneliness, trying to find community.
currently the no affordable options, mostly limited to Airbnb for short-term travelers. And then the other options are just much more expensive. We are NomadX, a global co-living community for digital nomads, offering minimum one-month stays with our start here in Portugal and a part of Startup Lisboa. What we offer is an integrated offering, starting with co-live, co-work, solutions, signature properties, going into co-live properties that are part of our local host network, and then wrapping that all with our community. What we offer is a marketplace solution, making it easy to find places by city, by neighborhood, uh, by rooms, and then also by hosts as well. We, start, we got our start here in Portugal, in Lisbon, in Porto. And we're expanding into Spain, into Europe, and then also all across the world. Current revenue is 260,000. We expect to have 1.8 million by next year, growing to 10 million and then up to 100 million by the year 2022. With 30% margins, average stays of two and a half months. We currently have 500,000 in founder funding. We're seeking 1.5 million in seed capital and additional 20 million in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, early stage uh, in capital as well. Thank you very much. Hi, um, how are you going to be competing with WeWork when they have their own facilities, their own standard quality, and you're kind of like using kind of like Airbnb point of view? Like how you maintain the level and the quality? Yeah, so our, our properties, I would say, is very similar to the early Airbnb model, where the main part of our network is third-party properties through third-party hosts. Um, that are typically it's more of a spare bedroom type model. Typical pricing is anywhere from 450 up to 850 per month, which is much lower than the other anything else that's in the marketplace. WeWork is offering more kind of large scale solutions, much more institutional. Um, from what I hear from my friends, it's like working out of a jail cell. <laughs> We're offering more access to the local communities, integrating them in with the local communities, and, and giving back much more to the local communities than the WeWorks. We're actually a solution, an alternative to a WeWork. Airbnb has had a lot of problems in a number of cities in Europe and in the United States. Uh, there have been even specific taxes that have been put in place just to target Airbnb. Um, do you think you're going to fall into those? Uh, have you considered the risks yeah, so I think that's actually a solution that we're solving. Um, we have minimum one month, 30 day stays. So we're not considered short term rentals. We're actually considered longer term home stays. Um, so we can avoid a lot of those issues. We're also um, integrating much more with the local communities. Our typical members don't want to be a part of the uh, local touristic crowds. They want to be part of the local communities and neighborhoods that are calmer, more relaxing, really integrating, getting to know the bartenders, not just coming in and staying for three days at a time and destroying the apartments. So we're finding is the hosts are actually much more interested in working with us than traditional Airbnbs. The tax rates are also much lower for the longer term stays than they are for the short term stays. And there's also a lot of limitations being placed today on the number of apartments that can be Airbnbs in certain locations. So we're able to avoid a lot of those issues and create an alternative solution. The red dots across Europe, are those locations you're already operating and have places, or is that where you plan to expand? Uh, we plan to expand to all the top digital nomad friendly cities throughout Europe and then also throughout the world. Currently, we're just in uh, Lisbon and Porto, but we plan to expand to other cities here in Portugal as well into places like Braga and Viana de Castelo, Peniche, and even down through the south into you know, Lagos and other places. And what here. does that plan entail? What's the strategy? Uh, well, we have a media strategy where we're targeting the, the cities, attracting leads, and then we're converting the leads um, into properties. We have a, a team that goes out and meets with the property owners to make sure that they're friendly hosts, that they can speak English, 
um, that the, the properties meet a certain standard. We're also, for certain properties, even bringing in our professional package, which includes uh, monitors, ergonomic chairs, uh, Wi-Fi extenders, even nice bath signature bathrobes and uh, slippers so you get the real feel like you're staying in a hotel. Um, so we really try and extend the experience in a way that you just don't find on an Airbnb or typically if you look for something on, the, on Facebook groups or other things. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Dave. So next up we have Andrea from Healthy Virtuoso. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Andrea Severino and I'm the founder of LT Virtuoso. This is Franco, he's my dad. He's 70 years old and I really care about him. Sometimes I fight with Franco about his sedentary behavior and uh, one day Franco came back at home and said, uh, Andrea, today I've been working a lot, I'm very tired. I said, yes, Franco, you're 70 years old, how much you could be could be uh, walking around. I checked his phone, his iPhone, and I saw that he has been walking for 13 kilometers. As soon as I told you and I gave him the awareness, he started telling everyone by the phone, today I've been walking 13 kilometers. The day after, he came back and he said, today I walked 14 kilometers. The day after, he came back and he said, today I walked 15 kilometers. And so we understood that there was something on it. That day, I chose to bring my father out for dinner to reward him for what he reached, what he achieved. With awareness, with the vanity, with the challenges, and with the rewards, that's how Virtuoso was built. Basically, Virtuo Virtuoso is uh, just an application that uh, rewards and incentivizes the people to live an healthier lifestyle, and it does you through psychology, gamification, and big data. We have launched a prototype in May with a just uh, expenditure a budget of 2,000 euro. We reached uh, 35,000 download, 1.5 million accesses, and more than 25 active partnership. The cool thing is that uh, it's not the application that you need to track, you use to track your activities, so you use to track uh, your sport, your data. It's just an application that uh, keeps the data from your phone, from Apple Health, from Google Fit, and all the related application to incentivize people doing more. The process is very simple because you just download it, upload the data sharing, and you get rewarded for what you daily do. Our aim is to fight uh, the sedentary and uh, to fight uh, the um, the obesity, because those are cause of uh, most of the chronic disease uh, and uh, the bad feeling of the people. We are starting from Italy, as I said, we launched in May, but uh, our goal is to expand quickly abroad. We've got a really high engagement from the users and really low cost per acquisition, and so that's why we're already moving the other markets. Those are uh, some of the companies that we are working with. As you can imagine, uh, this kind of processes is really interesting for the insurance companies, pharmaceutical companies, but as well for people related to the health, to the sport, and to uh, the normal behavior. We are creating a marketplace which is based on data. So what we do, we understand which is the need of the person, and based on, on this need, we uh, allow them to use uh, uh, buy a specific product or service. We are working today to sell, as I said, affinity service and employees program. We are talking with insurance company to implement this in their companies, and we are talking as well with the pharmaceutical market to uh, uh, increase the adherence to the therapy. Um, we founded the company in July 2017. We had an investment of 150,000 euro from the CMO of Money Farm, from the T director of Goldman Sachs, and from many different people involved in the community. We raised again uh, 150,000 150, euro from the banks and uh, we are going to launch it officially in the coming weeks, in two weeks in Italy. This, uh, this is our team, it's mainly made from people working uh, in marketing, design and accountancy. Uh, we have got uh, 18 people uh, working on this project. Um, this is uh, my father now, he became a virtuous user so I'm really pleased about it. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for the pitch. It's Thank a, you. It's a good, um, good cause. Um, so there's many apps that are counting steps and are, uh, you can compete with your friends. 
Is there any other usages other than walking, running, cycling that you're using in this app? We've got a different positioning. So we don't track any data. We just use the data that is already tracked through the other application. So we stay on top. We say, use Nike, use Rantastic, use Strava, use Headspace. And for using those applications, you get rewarded. So that's how we are building even our customer base, through the partnership with those applications. So what's these, you're talking about rewards. You get free coffee, you get uh, Every day you earn credits. Healthcare. With the credits, uh, we get uh, discounts or free products by the partners. So we've got a partnership with Under Armour, with Adidas, uh, with Garmin, with Polar, with many different corporations. We are still building more with uh, companies selling food, healthy food, uh, with uh, the services for the gym, uh, with many corporations related to the fitness. To the what's their stage. incentive? Is they give a huge discount to all free products. So now we are talking with GetFit, which is a big corporation in Italy for gym. They're giving the first 20 days for free. Because what we do is we put in touch the demand with the offer. And uh, it's not just a discount voucher, because the people need uh, to gain those credits and then to use those credits to buy, to buy the, the, these discounts. And on top of this, we've got Amazon vouchers and similar stuff. So mine is maybe a step away from that question, but similar because I've used some of these reward um, platforms before. I guess my question is, what is your unfair competitive advantage or unique competitive advantage relative to, to, to these other reward incentive Which is, programs? Which is our competitor. What is your unique competitive advantage within the landscape? Is a, is an independent platform. So what does it exist today? are uh, mainly vertical application that counts steps, sweat coin, or vertical application that works just for employees' companies, for, em uh, for employees' uh, yeah, corporation, or just, uh, uh, for example, Vitality in UK, um, services that does for people within insurance. We cross everyone, we get, went mass market, we make it available for everyone, and then through this, through the data, through the engagement, we are creating the value for the corporation. And so who funds you? The, um, the partners, uh, the partner partners companies, they fund you? Well, basically, we, at the beginning of the project, we saw that it was very easy to get the money. So we choose the right people to come in, to come in and invest. As I said, there is the CMO of Money Farm, which is uh, really related to this business. Uh, the CTO at the beginning has been uh, the IT director of Goldman Sachs. Uh, so he helped us and he put the money too. There are some famous journalists. There is a world football champions behind uh, from 1982, Marco Tardelli. We choose a lot of people in each vertical uh, segment. But you said that um, if, you, um, if you're giving out uh, Amazon vouchers and discounts to Adidas, et cetera, et cetera, um, are, they, okay. are they paying you to get the information from, that you're collecting from the clients? We are not sharing the information so far. Okay. Our business models comes uh, uh, from uh, the value that we generate for the partners uh, through the discounts. It comes for the service that we sell to the corporation. So imagine to use this in the customer base of an insurance company. So we get paid based on the savings that they do on the customer base, on the loss ratio, which is... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have to move on to the next pitch. So thank you so much. Next up is Philippe from Greener Act. Hello everybody, my name is Philippe and I'm the founder of Greener Act. Greener Act, travel and act in a more sustainable way. Our mission is to improve the livelihood of local communities while contributing to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations by traveling and acting in a more sustainable way. So the question here is how can we minimize the negative impacts of tourism growth? How can we safeguard and protect our natural environment? And finally, how can we harness the power of the travel industry in order to sustain local economies? There's great existing initiatives all around the world. What Greener Act will give them is the right power and the right tool to join us in this sustainable revolution. So how big is the market? It's pretty huge. According to Virtuoso, 80% of the millennium will choose a hotel which gives back to the local community. Same thing with Condé Nast, uh, with Condé Nast uh, uh, Traveler. 
nearly 60% of the readers will choose a hotel which gives back to the community. And in the state, 70% of the adult traveler will choose a company which, will give up, which protects the environment. So could sustainable travel engagement be the answer to over-tourism? Well, we believe it is. And this is how and why Greener Act can really make a difference. So when you join the platform, you can start creating your greener places, which is basically where you showcase your good practices and your products. After you can create greener events, which is where the traveler can participate and engage in community works, then you can create your causes, which is as well where the traveler can donate and support your local causes. And after you got your greener cluster, which is dashboards that you can have intelligence reporting and benchmarking of your own community cluster. So what are the USPs of Greener Act? So first, it's a free app for the traveler to facilitate market penetration. You can create your own sustainable profile and you can measure your engagement as well. You can link each events and causes to one of the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations. You can challenge your friends and colleagues through sustainable gamification. You can measure as well your employee performance and find out who is the greener employee of the month. So where are the revenue streams? So we've got some banners, we've got some digital banners, which is where you can advertise and give traction to your company. And after we've got some different reports and dashboards, which you can use for your, for your CSR reporting, and which will give you different market intelligence and, diff and how your company is performing and impacting in your, in your region. So the financial highlights, as of the second year, will be financially sustainable. We need 50,000 50, business users. And in three years, we think that we can reach 9 million revenue. But more importantly, we commit to give 10% of our profit back to the greener causes that we are supporting. So where, where are we now? We are recruiting uh, two technicians for the IT department, one DMO and one sales executive. We are available on iOS and Android, and we are looking at, we are seeking 1 million, fund, 1 million euro of funding so that we can support two years of uh, commercial expansion. We want to become the market leader in sustainable travel engagement. So this is the team, myself, I'm the CEO. We've got Daniel Frey, who's an international sustainable expert. We've got a Portuguese development team, an IT team. And we've got Dimitri here, which are our marketing and hospitality guru. So if you really want to make a difference when traveling the world, well, download Greener Act now and start with us the sustainable revolution. Greener Act, travel and act in a more sustainable way. Thank you. You got a question, panel? So one of the problems of applications today, people don't do download many applications. This is a one-time use, right? I come to my vacation, now I want to be part of it. So does it make more sense to be integrated with uh, um, websites and applications that are dedicated for travel? As an example, uh, Airbnb and others? Correct. That could be one option that we are looking at to see, you know, find the partners who would be able to join us in the sustainable revolution. But this is as well for companies, for hotel groups, even for cities. You know, you can have Lisbon who starts creating different events and they want to raise their sustainable profile. So then download Greener Act and they create their own place. And after all the events that they, 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 uh, they create, they can invite travelers, not only travelers, but people in the community. The idea really here is to benefit local communities. Uh, what's the, uh, for, for geographic expansion, what's sort of the go-to-market strategy? So we're going to start, we've got a pilot test in Madeira Island. So we managed to convince the regional government there to, to start the app there. And after we want to come to Lisbon and Portugal and after Europe. But first, we, the app will be available in Portuguese, English and in Spanish. So these are the markets that we're looking at. So working with the, go the governments of different places to... F so basically, we try to convince tourism board or destination management companies so that they can see this is benefit for, beneficial for the tourism industry. Because the more travelers come, and if you use that power of the traveler, you can really benefit, benefit local communities. So it's really through DMO, destination management organization, that we try to grow the, the company. So going back to this uh, question about applications, how are you going to get people to uh, download it? Uh, today it's not easy to get people to download apps. And the second question, can you sure. elaborate a bit more about your financial model? 
and how are you making uh, revenues? Sure. So, so first for the um, for for downloading, we're gonna try to convince all the stakeholders, which are basically the tourism industry, the hotel, the restaurant, the travel agency, to start using, so that they can see a benefit there. This is a great information for their corporate social responsibility reporting. So if they use it after, they can contact directly the customer before he comes on a holiday and say, hey, by downloading this app, you can help us to improve community life around us. You know? So that will be the mechanism to be able to download the app. And about the financial model? So the financial model, so basically what we use is through a, su a, su a subscription model. You've got two levels, you've got a silver and a gold, and it gives you just market intelligence and your, your, your report on the impact that the company is having, always linked to the sustainable development goal. So that'll be a great CSR kind of reporting that you can show for your company. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Philippe. Thank you very much. All right, and now we have the final pitch of the fourth round. Please welcome Denis from Smart Calls. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Denis from Smart Calls team, and we provide businesses with the most valuable resource, the time. You see, 60% of working time, your sales, customer success, and call center agents are involved in typical tasks. So our idea is to free all the time for the things that really matter. An example, let's assume you need to call 50,000 clients with a survey. To do so, you need 25 call center agents, eight working days, and 1,600 hours of calls, which in the United States will cost you $35,000. With smart calls, you can do it within one day Design your intelligent voice bot in 30 minutes and reduce your costs more than three times. Let's see how it works. With easy to use visual editor, you will be able to create smart call campaigns in a very short time. No technical skills required to create a multifunctional scenarios based on your business needs. When your scenario is ready, just upload your contact list in Excel or from your integrated CRM using the API and reach up to million people to deliver valuable information on time. In more than 180 countries. In one day, in native language. And track your success. We provide with all the necessary details. Let's design an intelligent customer success together. So, I hope you like the voice, because it was our voice bot speaking. So, in addition to mentioned benefits, we offer pay-as-you-go business model, which is affordable to any company. So, anyone can freeze the time for the challenges that require human empathy, creativity, and decision-making. And that leads to the outstanding customer experience, constantly growing revenue, and high profitability of business. Our target market is $80 billion. We reduce costs more than three times so we can save $160 billion to market for the call center costs. So here we are, my passionate team. Uh, each of us has more than 15 years of experience. Andre in uh, development of IT products. And uh, me and my brilliant co-founder Sayoda is uh, in sales and marketing. So together we have gained almost 50 B2B customers and got $100,000 of revenue. Our goal for the next year is to reach 12 million of calls and $1 million in annual revenue. And to achieve that, we are looking for investments in sales and marketing activities and for further product development. So don't miss a chance to innovate your communications and uh, register at smartcalls.io and try it yourself. Thank you. Um, so we love call centers. We invested right. in two companies in the last year. We think it's, uh, it's not going anywhere. Um, my question, you're, this is for outbound calls, right? Not inbound. It's for teams who, have, who are, we need to call to massive amount of people. Uh, our plan is to make the, the same thing, the same visual editor for voice bots, uh, also for the inbound calls in the next year. So the first quarter of the next year. Right. At the moment, it's for outbound calls. So it's for big projects that you just want to send uh, call million people in parallel? There's two options how to use it. Either it's mass call campaign, or it's trigger calls. 
uh, like uh, something happens in your CRM, the order is received, or you need to and, uh, and you need to confirm the order, so you can use this voice bot for trigger calls, which is uh, generated via CRM system, for example, or ERP, and so on. And uh, well, actually, yeah. What do you do not to be uh, marked as spam? <laughs> it depends on the companies, but uh, we, uh, let's say we po are fully compliant with different um, policies and rules. For example, we have integration with do not call register in the United States and so on. So as soon as we uh, receive some um, claims from the customers, we should uh, block this uh, customer which uses for our product for the bad usage. So are you, uh, as, well as, as well as any telecom provider in the world. Are you GDPR compliant? Yes, exactly. If you use smart calls, you, you agree with terms of service and privacy policy, so you're, which is in the full GDPR compliant. Yeah. So I love anything that saves resources, time or money. Uh, so I think it's a great idea. I was just wondering, how do you, what, what percentage of the customers that you currently have have uh, you know, the calls being blocked? So how do you get past someone like me that the second my phone rings and it's automated, I hang up or I block the number? Well, first uh, we have a voicemail detection, not to talk with your, our voice bot, not to talk with your um, voicemail. Okay. And uh, if you want to block it, once again, if you are in, America, in the United States, you, have, you can use a do not call register to block such calls. Uh, I just don't get the question. You mean how do you, you can block these calls? Or If the companies that are hiring you have a, a large percentage of those that their outbound calls are going to that are getting blocked, they may not use you. So I'm just wondering, do you have that number of what percentage? Ah, well, it depends on the contact base and uh, the use case which was calling. Because if it's uh, order confirmation, you expect in this call. You just don't expect to talk with the voice bot, which is actually very uh, fun and interesting. And uh, if there is some kind of lead generation campaign, for example, uh, of course, we will be uh, hanging up much more. So it depends. It's de it depends on the use case. So it varies from, let's say, 30% uh, in some call, uh, let's say, standard call calling up to the 199% uh, if you had some kind of uh, service call, like order confirmation, something like that. And my last question, how long are the contracts with the customers? Well, we started, uh, let's say, to sign up the customers uh, six months ago. At the moment, they are still uh, working with us. So we don't have any reasons why they, why they should stop this uh, services, because it's really uh, cost efficient thing. Okay. Yeah. So something else? Uh, customers are mainly call centers? No, it's actually uh, depends. Uh, it's a uh, banking, e-commerce companies, uh, even the uh, car manufacturers. So they have some specific cases like test drive confirmation and so on. And uh, we also have a small customers because if you are at the growth stage, but your, uh, the quantity of your customers is uh, higher than you have, so you have two people in the, uh, in the company. So it's better to use the voice bot and call to all customers in time than to just hire new people once again and once again and once again. So it's, a, let's say, a smart, smart way to uh, make a greater customer experience. Thanks. Thank you. OK. Thanks, Denis. So that was the last pitch of the day. I want to thank all of our participants today. It's really hard to pitch at the best of the times, and, and you know, in this environment especially. Uh, the judges are going to put in their, their final scores, and then we're going to tabulate the winner for this round. While we do that, I want to talk a little bit, you know, um, Hanan, I was hoping you could tell me a bit about when you think back to the most compelling pitches you've heard as an investor. Yeah, what are, what are the sort of through lines? What are the things that really stand out for you? Um, so I, li I like to see products that already were launched, of course, as an investor who is not looking to, do, to um, invest when it's too risky. So some of the companies here are already launched and some are pre-launched. Um, the second thing is about um, the pain. So we love companies that are actually solving real pains. And uh, as Christina said, companies that are saving costs are probably the first one that could, you can go get uh, into the market because you can show uh, return on investment very, very fast. So some of the companies had it here today and some not yet. Um, do you find that people talk too much about one thing and not enough about something else? Are there things that you find are missing generally when people come and pitch to you guys? I think it's hard in three minutes to cover everything. I would prefer to talk mainly about the product, less about revenues and 
profit because it's too early and uh, that's you know you, your main your main um, uh, goal when you're pitching to investors is to get to a real meeting when you can elaborate about everything else so I would focus mainly on the product Felipe how about you what are you looking for uh, value I don't care if a startup is based in blockchain or node or whatever like nobody cares if Facebook is built in one or another technology but the worst the value like that's the main thing that I love to say to see and also when they're pitching kind of like giving us some kind of question that we can ask and that they know how to answer because sometimes they can get really tricky and they get really nervous and they can put all the entire pitch down for not knowing how to answer and if you don't know an answer just say we can talk later do you guys, has there been one pitch in the past that stood out for you of someone who really sort of nailed all the, the questions that you're looking to answer? I think one thing that, that wasn't addressed, and again, potentially because it's too early, but I think uh, companies, uh, teams that have a good understanding of where their valuation lies today and that they can actually justify it. Um, and then secondarily, uh, a very well-defined a plan for go-to-market strategy. Oftentimes, the the target customer or client is ill-defined, um, so I think that that's those are usually two two shortcomings uh, that I see. One thing that I liked with Andrea's pitch as an example is, I like when a story is told about where did where were you inspired to come up with this idea. So it has to be based on who is who's the client that that you solve the pain point or who's the family member. Uh, so so really describing the pain point that you're solving, I think, helps people get connected with the product or service. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that um, an additional point that, that that is important for investors is going to be that, that you completely nailed it as regards as to who your competition is and what makes you different from them. That is, sometimes it was addressed, not necessarily all the time, uh, and, and it really makes a difference because a lot of these products, there is some level of competition out there that does the same thing. So less time practicing and more time researching? OK, I want to uh, invite everybody up to the stage for the announcement of the winner. Sorry. OK, so the winner of the fourth round of Pitch Battle is Naz and Aline, Ala, Aliner. Excuse me, Aliner.